Guys, welcome back to Draw and Conversation. As always, I am your dedicated nerd, host, and artist, Danny Fisher. And today, we are drawing a fictional history and greatest moments of Superman. And we're doing it right now. So guys, welcome back to Drawing Conversation. As always, I wanna thank you so much for your time. I know it's precious and thank you so much for tuning in. But guys, I am extremely pumped that today I have my first guest artist. His name is Stephen Fox. You can find him across social media as Fox Storytelling. He is an amazing artist. In fact, if you wanna learn how to make comics from the inception to publication, he's putting together an amazing, I would almost call it a coursework, but a great YouTube adventure that you can follow him along as he creates his own intellectual property, XL Comics. Man, Steven, thank you so much for nerding out with me. Man, it is, honestly, this has been a blast. I have loved working on this with you. It has been like we're back in high school, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. And hey, today we are talking about the Man of Steel, the last son of Krypton, Kal-El, Clark Kent. We're talking about Superman. Steven, fill us in on a little bit about Superman. My first exposure to Superman was the Chris Reeves uh, movies. Uh, when those were out, uh, he was interviewed, who do you think Superman is? And he said he's a friend. And I think that that really summarizes it. And it, it kind of calls back to the origin of the character, like when he was created. Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster were teenagers, late teenagers, 16, 17, when they first came up with the idea. Jerry Siegel in particular looked around the world and just felt like there was so much. He felt like that your, your average citizen just needed an advocate. If he couldn't pick out that person in reality, he was going to make it. So. The two of them took an idea that they had for a, I think it was an essay called uh, the, the Reign of Superman, and they they just scrapped the idea and started from, from the ground up. And what they came up with was what we know as Superman. He was a strange visitor from a, an alien world. They drew some inspiration from Moses and uh, from strongmen in the circus. And uh, <clears throat> um, at the time, being a, being a reporter was a very, it was a respected profession. It was your job to dispense truth, you know? The Moses piece is interesting to me because um, he's so often compared to Christ. When you look at Moses being put into that that reed basket um, and sent away from a dying people, it's not hard to see, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, and not to mention that the two guys that created him were both Jewish, so they were very familiar with that tale. So you have Superman, they, they did their best to shop it around. And this story, like Star Wars and Dr. Seuss and so many other success stories, nobody was interested, you know? When they did finally make a connection, uh, it was actually with a, a small publishing company that was known for printing very risque little magazines and tracks. <laughs> um, and they, if I, if I'm not mistaken, they used it as kind of a front for some illicit activities, or at least they, what? the owners of the um, <laughs> national um, at the time, they used it to kind of, uh, or they at least bragged about having connections to uh, the criminal underworld. Uh, but Superman. They were having some success um, with reprinting collections of uh, previously printed newspaper strips. And when they saw the, the idea for Superman, it, it piqued their interest. So they gave it a shot, and uh, it was nuts. It hit at just the right time. It was totally unique. The magazines were so cheap that kids could pick them up. And modern comics are lucky to sell 20,000, 30,000 units per month uh, for a steady selling comic. But Superman, every single issue, he was selling a million copies wow. a month. Just unbelievable. That kind of success had never been seen before in in uh, comics. And it quickly spawned into um, all kinds of licensing, movies, lunchboxes, you know, the drill, everything that Superman is on now. That's been going since the beginning, really. Yeah, I don't think there was ever really a character that captured so much of America's heart in a time, to your point, that America needed it. I mean, really did. So tell us more about the fictional history of the character. Throughout his history, he's been, just like any fictional character, he's been reinterpreted over and over uh, with mixed success. Most of the time, the defining piece that makes him successful is how close to a friend or a familiar person he is. Most of the time, when a, when a writer takes Superman and makes him and focuses so much on the alien aspect, they, they miss the fact that he is uh, a father figure, a brother figure. That's, that's really where he lives and breathes, you know. What other superhero has the alter ego of a farmer, you know? So Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster drew Superman for about 10 years. Um, then after them, various artists, artists took over. The most influential after Jerry Siegel, as far as an illustrator goes, is probably Kurt Swan. Kurt Swan was on Superman for decades and defined the look 
he was on that character for so long. Really, he wasn't fully replaced until uh, the mid-80s after an event called Crisis on Infinite Earths completely shook up the, the DC continuity, DC being the publisher for Superman. And after that massive event, DC Comics reached out to the, the most popular, most successful comic artist at the time in John Byrne and gave him just a lot of a lot of freedom to reinterpret the character. And that's exactly what he did. And he breathed complete, like just fresh life into this character. Uh, John Byrne was known for his work at Marvel Comics, so he had a very dynamic style. His focus was very different than, than uh, other creators that have been in Superman at the time. He created all kinds of uh, support characters like Maggie Sawyer. He turned Lois Lane into a more dynamic, challenging figure for Clark Kent. Uh, she wasn't repulsed by him like previous versions, but instead she saw him as a, a competitive peer and that added a new level to Clark Kent's personality. <clears throat> and the, I, for me, the biggest contribution John Byrne gave to the Superman mythology was Krypton. He designed that world from top to bottom. Uh, Man of Steel, the, the movie, actually has a ton of owes a debt to the Man of Steel limited series that John Byrne wrote and illustrated. Do yourself a favor and check it out if you haven't. There are two Man of Steel series. One is very recent and the, the other one um, is from, I believe, 1984, 84, 85. But it redefined Superman for, for my generation. Uh, after he died, they brought him back and experimented with that, those stories for a good while until 2011. Uh, DC had a, a company-wide event called the New 52 where they completely relaunched their whole line of books. Superman had some mixed reception. A lot of people weren't super happy with the character because they, they really embraced the, the alien heritage and he was a little more distant, um, not quite as friendly and outgoing, not really the father figure uh, that the previous version or interpretation had been. So uh, I believe it was 2016, I could be mistaken, but after several years in uh, New 52 continuity, DC relaunched their line again, as they are wont to do. And this time it was called Rebirth. and. The Superman we knew and loved, that was really the number one thing that DC wanted to do with the character, was bring him back to what the people knew, what his audience knew and loved him for. At that point, he actually had a, a kid uh, named Jonathan, uh, named after Clark Kent's father, and that, that character is in current continuity, and uh, he's actually a pretty compelling character. Um, it's So Superman just has this legacy, and it's the character. It's not his powers, it's not a, the fact that he's an alien, it's this... When he is interpreted correctly, there's something profoundly resonating about a super powerful character who has a incredible moral compass, who wants to do the right thing, and above all, just wants to help, you know? That's who Superman is, absolutely. You know, you hit the nail on the head. They have constantly reimagined, reinvigorated the comic. And, yeah, you know, man. in the beginning, he wasn't strong enough to move planets or even hold a black hole in his hand, like the amount of strength. I can't even wrap my head around what kind of strength you would need to hold even a tiny black hole. And Superman has done this. And so he walks around in this, essentially a bull in a china shop. You know, he walks around where everything is a house of cards with the slightest pat on the back, he could turn you to jelly. And he knows this, so he's always so careful with the strength. He's careful with, with if he blows out a candle, you know, what's on the other side? You know, he's constantly doing his best to walk through this world um, on eggshells at some point. How do you really embrace someone? One of my favorite story arcs with Superman was All-Star Superman. Now, this was written in November 2005 and went to October 2008. If you get a chance, please go out and read All-Star Superman. And it was written uh, by Grant Morrison and, and drawn by Frank Quietly. And it was amazing it honestly has got to be one of the best superman story arcs if you get a chance again go out grab this but what this does what all-star superman does is it tells us a what if story it takes place in the else worlds uh titles of dc and during one of superman's adventures of saving the world yet again he gets hit with a lethal dose of solar radiation now we all know superman gets his power from the sun right yeah it flies off the sun He's just one big solar battery. But in this story arc, it tells a what if. What if he got too much and he only had one year to live? What would you do with that time? What would you do with one year? And Superman, because he's hit with so much, he's not only stronger than he's ever been, but he's smarter than he's ever been. So he starts coming up with all manner of, not only philosophies, but ways of, of ending 
conflicts in other countries, ending starvation, um, working on solving huge economic and world problems, but also using every minute to better humanity. What could Superman do with unlimited, with being more powerful and infinitely more intelligent than he's ever been? And one of the coolest things that he does is he actually makes a serum that gives Lois Lane his strength, but only for 24 hours. And they go out and they sit out in adventures, but for the first time, the first time and the only time, he's actually able to embrace Lois. Like you would embrace, you know, someone you absolutely, truly, deeply loved and could hold them and not worry about crushing them, you know, with, with an accidental whim. Um, and I cannot state this enough. Man, it is such a good read and the artwork. It is, I still think today, one of the most defining Superman stories. Well, it, actually, one of my favorite stories is also, it's another kind of interstellar tale. Um, it was, so years ago, there, there was a Batman Superman title. It had a rotating um, group of artists and writers. Um, Ed McGinnis was on it for a good wow. while. He's one of my favorite artists. Uh, it really has a, a unique, chunky kind of approach to Superman that is really dynamic and interesting. My favorite s story from that series of Superman, Batman, um, took place around six, and, six or seven all the way to 13, and it was called, called Apocalypse. Superman and Batman essentially go to fight Darkseid, who is my favorite Superman villain. Uh, because as much as you like uh, Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor is only a cerebral challenge. You know what I mean? He has to enlist the help of others to really, to really be a challenge for for uh, Cal. But Darkseid is, I mean, Darkseid is like Lex Luthor and Doomsday, kind of rolled into one magnificent oh, absolutely. villain. <laughs> and nobody drew Darkseid quite like Michael Turner. Michael Turner was uh, an amazing artist, similar to John Byrne. He really brought a whole level of design and consideration to everything he drew he was a wonderful guy and unfortunately he passed away but um but yeah the work that he did on superman and uh, any other title he touched was just really influential uh, his dark side was powerful intimidating and unique anyway this story focuses on dark side captures a a newly minted Supergirl, <laughs> and uh, through the help of one of his uh, more bizarre minions granny goodness he brainwashes her to becoming one of his uh, female Furies, who is like just one of his his warriors. There's another one named Big Barda, and uh, just several others who are kind of like his Imperial Guard. And Superman and Batman have to go to Apocalypse to retrieve her. It's just a visually stunning book. The first the first uh, issue where they reveal Supergirl is just stunning. Anyway, it's one of my favorite stories, and the, one of the big reasons is because of Darkseid. I just, I love that character. I think he's a wonderful foil for Superman, and uh, it, just imagining those two going toe to toe. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you know? Absolutely. And again, who can you find that can, can match Superman in a fist fight? So anytime he can cut loose and really not hold back and hit something with all of his strength, and that thing hits back. Oh my gosh, dude! Just grab the popcorn. It's just going to be a good time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, hey, one of my all-time favorite story arcs is the story Kingdom Come. Yes. And yeah. This is written by Mark Wade and illustrated by Alex Ross. Not only does it have just an amazing artist, amazing vision, you can't, it is just a feast for the eyes, but the story is just so good. Um, and this was printed in 1996, just it's still to this day, one of the best story arcs. Now, I'm not going to ruin it, but at high level, all of these new heroes start coming in who have no respect for collateral damage, casualties, innocent lives. They come in and they want to be judge, jury, and executioner. And they show up on the scene and they actually kill their villains. And this, again, was happening in the height of the 90s, or this story was written during the height of the 90s, when you have hyper-violent heroes such as Wolverine, such as Spawn, such as Punisher, who end life versus bringing them to justice. And again, one of the things that makes Superman Superman, in his core, he believes that humans are fundamentally good. And all they need is an example, a light to show them the way. Which is why for me, he could lift Thor's hammer. Like there's no question, he could not only lift Thor's hammer, but then proceed to beat the snot out of him. Hey, that's, sorry, had, <laughs> had, to, uh, had to rant just a little bit, sorry, coming back. But in this story, he is being faced by the public who is turning their back on the old heroes, on the old ways, and thinking, why are they always throwing Joker in prison? He's always getting out and killing hundreds of people. And an anti-hero 
or I should say a vigilante style hero shows up and actually kills Joker in this story arc. Again, it's printed in the Elseworlds titles of DC. So it's not main Marvel Universe, or excuse me, <laughs> it's not main DC Universe, excuse me. But Superman and all the Justice League are founding members leave. And they leave, I want to say 30 years past, and the world is out of control. It's spinning out of control because you have these heroes, again, who are just taking life, who are killing as many innocents and bystanders as they are bad guys. So Superman shows back up to show them the way, to show them the light, that this is not how heroes behave. But in this, a huge battle erupts. A battle amongst these new heroes, old heroes, villains, vigilantes, all going toe to toe. This battle threatens to engulf the city and the UN make a decision to launch a nuclear strike and they drop it right on top of the battle. And Superman looking, obviously survives the blast, but looking left and looking right and seeing all his former colleagues, friends, brethren disintegrated. This is the first time, and it sends chills up my spine, still thinking about it now. It's the first time that Superman, it's like, okay, the gloves have come off. We're going full bright burn. And he takes off to go face the UN. Oh my gosh, he's getting his pound of flesh and I'm not gonna ruin it for you. But it was just, again, that pivotal, amazing story arc that just really kind of embodies everything great about Superman, but also shows you there is a dark side. There, there, there is a place of wrath in Kal-El. There, there is a part of that. Yeah, man. Honestly, Kingdom Come is one of the most inf influential fictional books in any medium or genre that I can think of, you know? Uh, Alex Ross is just amazing. Yeah, it's funny. One of my other favorite stories is is somewhat similar to Kingdom Come. It's not, I won't say it has the, the same long-term longevity um, or in, influence, but it, it made a huge cultural mark, and that was uh, Doomsday. So similar to Magog, Magog in Kingdom Come was kind of an icon of the, the current um, status of superhero comics uh, being over the top and grim and gritty. Doomsday, um, it's kind of in the same vein. He's not, he's a, uh, but he's a two-dimensional character whose only purpose is to destroy and wreak havoc and kill. He is a, a very unique foil for Superman in the fact that uh, Brainiac, Lex Luthor, Mixoplicked, Mixoplicket, Mix, Mix, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> yeah, him. Um, Absolutely. They're all cerebral challenges because it's difficult to come up with a physical foil for Superman. Plus, I think I don't think artists want to draw that destruction, you know. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> but Doomsday came on the scene at a time when DC was kind of asking fans, "Okay, do you care about Superman? What if he dies? What if he dies?" Um, so, in the fictional world, the story focused on Clark Kent being the only person who could stop Doomsday. This creature, he's introduced in a pitch black panel where you just hear his fist slamming against steel. Uh -huh. Doom, doom. And when he, when they finally show him, he's tearing through this steel. He's in a, a a green canvas um, just jumpsuit. His arms are tied behind his back with cables, or one of them is, and he just starts walking toward a city, a giant, like a, a, a big metropolitan area. And uh, in his way, as he's destroying things, superheroes cross his path, including the entire Justice League sans uh, Superman, and he just trashes them all. It's not even close. They go to great lengths to show that this thing is not even not even slowing down. Uh, dealing with even Martian Manhunter, who's supposed to be on the same level as Superman, you know what I mean? But when Clark shows up, he battles Doomsday unbridled. His other arm gets loose, and they just start fighting, and destruction happens, and it is, it's intense. And it's the, the story builds up into Superman number 75, and it was back in 1992 um, when Marvel was just destroying DC in sales. Image came on the, on the scene, and they were really challenging Marvel. So DC's um, share of the market was really shrinking and when this issue hit it made people stop and pay attention to them as a publisher again. Issue number 75 every page was a splash page illustrated by Dan Jurgens and inked by Brett Breeding. Every page was really it was really unique. Um, you would think that it would be challenging to continue a slugfest and make it engaging for you know the the entire duration of, a, of an issue and that one's extra long but th they did it man. It was compelling when he died, you actually kind of you actually kind of felt some remorse. There wasn't immediately a plan revealed that uh, he would be back. It was uh, it wasn't, you know, Kingdom Come is a really cerebral story. The Doomsday story was visceral. It was very emotional, very intense, very d dramatic and dynamic. 
yeah, it made a, a big impact. And Doomsday is a really compelling uh, character, or it becomes one anyway. You know, and with that, again, it's that one thing that Superman can't do. He Well, he can't do often, and that's really cut loose. And within Doomsday, we find something that is not only as strong, but potentially stronger than the Man of Steel. And when these guys go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, it is just yeah nonstop carnage. Just so much fun to watch again. You don't ever get to see Superman cut loose, but when he does, get ready for the show. And like you said, man, it wasn't the best story. It wasn't like, oh, this is pivotal. It's going to change things forever. But what it did, it was a watershed moment because from that we get the cyborg, we get the alien, we get the clone, we get steel, we get all these other story arcs that branch off like, well, that's just spider web from this quintessential point. Without this point, these other great stories can't be told. But what I love is we also get a real Zenkai boost. Yeah, exactly. For Superman, because <laughs> because when he comes back, man, when he comes back, he is. Well, let me let me back that up because when he first comes back, he's not quite as powerful. But then by the end of the story arc, we realize he's gone through a fundamental change, and he is no longer the Superman of the first meeting with Doomsday. Because from there, I mean, Lex Luthor, Darkseid, they've all tried to clone uh, Doomsday and make like Doomsday armies and things of that nature. And guess what? It, it, yeah, they're tough, they're, but it's but they're not fighting the Superman of the past. They're fighting the Superman of now, who's just uh, head and shoulders more powerful than he was fighting Doomsday. Just, just so much fun to watch. But hey, Steve, I cannot thank you enough for lending your time, lending your art, helping me put this together. I know this has been a big, I've been pulling you away from your projects. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you asking me to do this. It's been incredible. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching. I truly appreciate you nerding out with me and going through why I love Superman. Superman has always represented to me the character who will choose good when it's always so easy to choose evil. Now guys, thanks again for watching. If you haven't already, please subscribe, like, turn on those notifications, and leave a comment below. I also want to give another huge shout out to Stephen Fox. Thanks again for lending your artistic ability and tearing away from your project. Guys, you can find him on Instagram and YouTube as Fox Storytelling. On YouTube, you can follow his journey as he creates XL Comics, an amazing horror adventure comic book, and you can really see how the sausage is made. So guys, thanks again for watching, and I will talk to you again soon.